Okay, so good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Committee for Justice's virtual panel discussion on AMG Capital Man Management versus FTC, the court's ruling on monetary relief. I'm your host, Ashley Baker, and I'm the Director of Public Policy at the Committee for Justice. So a quick summary of the case. So last week, the Supreme Court decided AMG Capital Management versus Federal Trade Commission, and the unanimous court held that the FTC's authority under Section 13B of the Federal Trade Commission Act, which explicitly allows the FTC to obtain permanent injunctions in federal court without conducting administrative proceedings, does not authorize the commission to obtain court-ordered equitable monetary relief such as restitution or disgorgement. This question has loomed over the FTC since the late 1990s when the commission began to use 13B to seek restitution, disgorgement, and other equitable monetary relief. Additionally, Justice Breyer, writing for the court, suggested that if the FTC's unchallenged authority to seek monetary awards after administrative proceedings is inadequate, the commission should ask Congress for greater remedial authority. The debate has now shifted across the street to Congress which considered such a request from the FTC last year. Our panel will discuss this case, so we'll discuss the, its implications. And I'm now going to introduce our two panelists in the order in which they will be speaking. So first we have John Vecchioni. Mr. Vecchioni is Senior Litigation Counsel for the nonprofit New Civil Liberties Alliance, representing clients against the Ministry of State. He was previously President and CEO of the Nonprofit Cause of Action Institute, also advancing the constitutional order. He practiced at a number of DC law firms, including the eponymous John J. Vecchioni Law Firm, John J. Vecchioni Law. Mr. Vecchioni um, focuses his practice on strategic litigation in the federal district and appellate courts, including the Supreme Court of the United States. He is an experienced trial and appellate advocate, having tried cases and argued appeals across the country. He is a member of the bars of the state of New York, the District of Columbia, the Commonwealth of Virginia, as well as the Supreme Court of the United States and many federal courts. His cases are reported in scores of published opinions. Alden F. Abbott. Alden Abbott is a senior research fellow at the Mercatus Center. Prior to joining Mercatus, he served as the general counsel of the Federal Trade Commission. As the commission's chief legal officer and advisor, he represented the agency in court and provides legal counsel to the commission and its bureaus and offices. Prior to rejoining the FTC in April of 2018, Mr. Abbott served in executive positions at the Heritage Foundation and BlackBerry. He also held a variety of senior positions in the U.S. federal government, in the FTC, the Commerce Department, the Justice Department's Office of Legal Counsel, and the Antitrust Division. He speaks French, Spanish, and Italian. So the brief presentations by our panelists um, are going to be followed kind of a short discussion after which we will have a Q&A. The way that Q&A for these uh, work, if you're familiar, is if you can send me the, the question through the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen instead of, um, I won't call on you, just send that to me at any point throughout the webinar and I'll, I'll try to get to as many of these questions um, by the end as we possibly can. Um, so that, with that, John, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Ashley, and I'm, I'm really happy to be here with Alden. Um, and uh, obviously, uh, I'm with the New Civil Liberties Alliance. We were uh, very much against the FTC, but I'm always glad to see Alden uh, whenever I whenever uh, we meet in town, which hasn't been for a long time now. <laughs> um, but in any event, um, so I take uh, a look at this. Uh, I've never been in government except for a brief um, clerkship. I've always been on the defense side against the government, um, in either criminal or civil matters. When I'm against the FTC, um, I, um, it's always been, um, you know, as a defendant. So my outlook on this is what, what is the practical effects on the clients? What is the, what's going on here? And AMG versus FTC um, is the culmination of a, of a 40 year story, really. And um, I'll first tell about the case. What happened in what the Supreme Court did last week was Justice Breyer in a 9-0 decision um, determined that Section 13B of the FTC Act, which provided for injunctions in the proper case, um, was not available to the FTC to just go in co into court and get any amount of money they wanted from defendants. Um, at, at under primarily, they, they primarily use it, use it for deception and unfairness claims. They use it in antitrust, but not so much. Um, and, and Breyer basically said, look, Congress didn't give you this power. That's not what 13B was given for. And the FTC has a lot of 
um, administrative power in its own agency. And uh, there was there's section 19, there's certain other areas whereby you they are able before an administrative law judge in their own um, precincts to um, issue cease and desist orders, stop doing that, and also to recover money after the proceeding. But what happened, and the story is kind of interesting, and, and the Supreme Court cites something that we, we NCLA, I, I put in an amicus brief on this, um, because one of the things that happened um, is that this 13B power that the FTC has used to seize billions and billions of dollars. I feel a little like Carl Sagan. I don't even remember, but he would, he would always say billions and billions. And, and that's a big number. And they seized billions and billions of dollars um, from various defendants uh, saying that they had used deceptive practices or unfair practices. And I don't, I never believed that this was how the FTC was supposed to proceed, but it, it developed over time. And if you look at the FTC Act, it doesn't say under 13B, and they shall be able to collect all this money, and they should be able to get restitution or disgorgement, which is what they claim. And there is in this whole story something that I found interesting. I put it in our briefs. Um, Breyer cited it twice, although he didn't quite go into the detail that we did in our brief. But there is a fella, um, an FTC lawyer by the name of David Fitzgerald. And David Fitzgerald gave a talk, a, a, he presented a paper um, before the FTC, uh, I think on the 90th anniversary of the FTC, it was like in 2004. And uh, the name of the paper for anyone who's interested is um, the genesis of consumer protection uh, uh, under section 13B, uh, re um, remedies under section 13B. And it's available online. And, and he tells the fascinating story um, which he approves of. I mean, he's for it. He, he helped design it. And all the way back to the 70s, the FTC often follows what the SEC does. And the FTC uh, saw this case, which um, the, on injunctions called, um, it was Porter versus Warren Holdings. And the, 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 during the war, World War II, uh, when someone my age says the war, that's what they mean. But anyway, World War II, um, they had, uh, they said, yeah, you can get injunctions under certain statutes, not this statute. And that had been expanded and expanded and expanded because the courts have power to issue injunctions and, and have equity. Our federal courts are full um, law and equity courts. So they kind of bootstrapped the power of the courts onto the power of the agency. And he comes up with a plan, uh, the FTC does in the early 70s after uh, a case comes out, um, by the SEC, um, and that 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 case is um, it's Texas Holdings, I'm pretty sure, versus SEC, and they get restitution. So what they FTC does here, and it's all in the memo, but I, I'm just going to break it down really quickly. Is the first thing they do is they get consent orders. They sue somebody under 13B, and they get a consent order with the defendant saying you're going to put this money in escrow, and then uh, you're not going to get that money anymore. That'll come to us. Well, it's a consent order. Courts love consent orders. Their job is done. That's wonderful. So they they didn't look into it. Both sides were agreeing. They got consent orders. So then the FTC goes up against weak, unrepresented parties or parties who default. And they say to the court, look, here's precedent. It's the consent order, right? And the consent order that they just got with this other guy who wanted to get out of trouble is then used as precedent in a weak uh, defendant. And they get the consent, they get a default judgment. I love that. So they get a default judgment, once again, kind of uncontested, or they have some uh, weak uh, opponent. And now, now they've got consent orders, they've got judgments, and they're off to the races. So they then say that 13B is allowed in all these areas. So what do they do? Well, they start using it a lot. And, and, and the FTC was very forthright with the court, which obviously should be. Uh, and, and since Alden was uh, GC, I would expect nothing less. But the fact is, they were very, they were very forthright with, uh, with the court. And they said, yeah, we, we use this a lot. We think it's great. We use it a lot. And we want to keep using it. And they used it more than their own proceedings to recover money. And it became, 
as I as I've always said, it, be, it became the tail began wagging the dog because this an injunction it should be used in conjunction with other proceedings. The FTC starts a proceeding and they say we don't like this. This is a deceptive act. Stop doing it. Stop saying those words. And they go get to court to say to the, while this goes on, you stop saying those words, um, or you stop doing this practice. I think that's what it what it was supposed to be about. But instead, they had a better deal. The FTC had a better deal, and that's this. You've got millions and millions of dollars. We now have a complaint. We say you are a scammer, as the acting head of the, of the uh, FTC said after this ruling. It, it favors scammers. Well, there are no cases that you cannot feed your children representing people who are wholly innocent. I will tell you that right now. So uh, I always say Gideon v. Rain, Wainwright, Brady versus Maryland, every landmark case, there's somebody who's maybe a little hinky involved. But the fact of the matter is, um, they said, we got all the, they go and they say, you're doing a bad thing. And they have the court seize all your money and they give it to a receiver. Well, now go get a lawyer. Go get a lawyer because they seize your money, your company's money, sometimes your wife's money. They seize everything and hold it and give it to a receiver. The receiver then starts spending it. So how are you going to get a lawyer? It's very, very good for an agency when they can take all your money at the very beginning because then you can't prove that you didn't do what they're accusing you of because there's nobody representing you. That's one of the most insidious things about 13B. It's always bothered me. It's one of the reasons I'm so happy with Breyer's decision, although he doesn't mention this, what I just mentioned. So this developed over time. It was developed by the FTC, as I would say, malice aforethought, and as they would say, good lawyering. Um, and so I, I think that it developed and it became everything. And, and um and Fitzgerald, David, in his memo, he admits that the text and the legislative history of the F, of Section 13B of the FTC Act uh, simply doesn't support it. So he puts this in his memo. I thought I thought that was a good fact. You like to find that sort of thing when you have Supreme Court justices. You know what they like? They like the text, and they like the, some some of the other ones like the legislative history. So when you've admitted outright that none of that supports this, you're in a good spot. So I, I felt good about it um, going in. Uh, I do think that, uh, and I think we're going to have a discussion about this, so I won't get into it too much. What's the FTC going to do now? Um, well, I think I have looked at some of the papers they put in. So last week, uh, the order comes out. It's 9-0. It says it's got to be perspective relief. Um, you can't use it to uh, disgorge. And that's, I will mention that about equity. Disgorgement is supposed to be, they take the money that you took from somebody else wrongfully, and they give it to the people who were wrongfully taken from. That's not quite how both the SEC in, in, in the Lou case that came out last year, um, as I said, the SEC and the FTC are different acts, but they do a lot of the same things. So the SEC Act, the Supreme Court came out and said, yeah, you've got disgorgement, but what you're doing isn't disgorgement. So you do have to show a pot of money and then show that it's going to people. And that's not always how these disgorgements were happening. So I think there's a lot of open questions. What is the SEC going to do? And I have just looked this morning at some of the papers they put in because all the district court judges said, all right, uh, parties who were before the FTC, you two get together and you put in a joint statement and tell me what you want to do next. And the FTC's position, I think, is going to be like a guy in a movie who uh, trips, falls down a mine shaft, gets covered in, in, in coal dust, gets all banged up, and then jumps up and says, ta-da, I meant to do that. And I, I think there's going to be a lot of ta I meant to do that. And Section 19 lets us do it, and all these other rules let us do it. And so nothing's changed. We fought like maniacs over 13B all this time for 30 years for no reason, because all this other stuff lets us do it. And we'll see how that plays out. And I'll, I'll turn it over to Alden. That's my, that's my, uh, my view of the state of play and what happened. Well, well, thanks, John. That's a very entertaining discussion. And you make a lot of good points. I think uh, one of the arguments, I'll just mention passing, the FTC put in its brief. I, I emphasized, look, you know, there's some justices who believe in the original public meaning, the original meaning of what text says. So it was an attempt to make this argument that, look, the term permanent injunction may not talk about money, 
But going back to Justice Story in the early 1800s, going back to some other statute in the 19th century, when you see permanent injunction, that necessarily implies the ability to get money. And the court, uh, nine and zip, they had nothing uh, good to say about that. In fact, they didn't really even address that argument. <laughs> I guess it shows they thought that this attempt to invoke the original meaning of permanent injunction didn't work. And then there were a number of other arguments the FTC made that were rejected. But as Don rightly says, where are we going to go? I think, very frankly, the FTC knows that uh, if it wants to keep getting a lot of this monetary relief, it's going to need a statutory fix. He mentioned Section 19, but Section 19 is kind of limited. You can only, they can only get monetary relief if they've had a final season assist order, which uh, before the administrative law judge and often the commission, appealable. So there's this final order say, saying, stop doing something. You've been doing something fraudulent, stop doing it. Then they knowingly, willfully violate the order. They get, uh, so the FTC can show they violated the order. And then the FT and it says that in cases of, of fraud or deceptive conduct, you can get monetary recovery. Uh, as John alluded to, there are a lot of FTC cases. There's been a lot of internet fraud. So there's a lot of fraud and, and clearly deceptive conduct, but there's also a lot of non truly fraudulent conduct. The FTC goes after on the consumer protection side. And frankly, in the, on the antitrust side, competition side, it's not really fraud. Uh, to the extent you think price fixing is fraud, well, the FTC doesn't go after hardcore bid rigging price fixing, the Justice Department does. So the reality is, and I think the FTC, without saying more, has realized that, that if they lost the case, which they did, they're going to have to get statutory relief. And that there's already been a lot of talk on the, on the Democrats in the Senate and the House about, oh yes, we need to move fast and, uh, and get statutory relief to help the FTC out. I think there are numbers of, of people, and now, very frankly, I'm no longer at the FTC. So as a policy matter, I think there's some real risk about going too broadly in that direction. And I had a short uh, a plug, a shameless plug here. I, I blog at Truths on the Market. Uh, truthonthemarket.com. And a week ago, uh, actually April 22nd, I had a short article called The Future of FTC Equitable Monetary Relief after AMT Capital Management. And I said, basically, look, if Congress is going to pass a new law giving them the ability to get relief, there's a lot, lots of error costs. Very frankly, uh, you need to be able to measure consumer harm. If you have an, an ad that you said claim when they have been impliedly uh, deceptive or uh, it's a complex transaction involving a patent settlement and you claim there's harm, often it's very, very hard to prove up um, the amount. And in some of these cases, you litigate to a very hard uh, on the defense side, people representing these firms will litigate, contest the fact that there was any unfairness or deception or contest the fact that there was antitrust violation. So I said that in, if you if you want look at it through a sort of a narrow cost, cost benefit lens, antitrust and even consumer protection, which is a, the approach that Judge Frank Easterbrook argued for in 1984 in a famous article called The Limits of Antitrust. He basically said, you know, there are lots of there's error, there's lots of error it's an inevitable part of administering a law like antitrust. So you should try and have some simple rules that minimize error risks. So should you be allowing the FTC to try and collect a lot of, of money uh, when they claim say there's a billion dollars in, in overcharges uh, in a reverse payment, uh, some sort of patent settlement when, it's, when, when there's, that number is very con contested? Probably not. So I argued that it's okay in hardcore fraud, you internet scam, you are going to get uh, a diamond. You are going to get all of these wonderful things, uh, uh, insurance policy. There's no such thing as that policy. It's the scam artist. You manage to freeze its assets. So the scam artist changes its identity. The money will be shifted to offshore accounts. You want to freeze it. And in cases where it's hardcore fraud, I think that, that that's a justifiable 
law enforcement sort of thing. Hardcore deception, what the reasonable man or person would have thought was deceptive. Tim Muris, the former FTC chair, argued for that sort of standard. I think that might make sense. But I'm, I'm saying, you know, avoid doing it in the area of antitrust. Uh, or um, now the FTC had actually something called a, uh, a uh, disgorgement policy statement for its antitrust cases came out with it in 2003 when the commission said we're rarely going to try and get money in antitrust cases only for the most egregious violations and also only in cases where we can readily without with almost no error measure the amount of harm. Uh, then it pulled that statement and rescinded it nine years later. And uh, then uh, FTC Commissioner Maureen Olhouse and later acting chair of the FTC had a very eloquent dissent saying this, this is bad public policy, bad law enforcement. So anyway, uh, there is going to be a really hard effort for legislation. We all know uh, legislation often comes a cropper. At the moment, uh, there's all this indignation, Capitol Hill uh, and at the FTC about what's happened. Will there be legislation? Maybe, but if there is, I would argue for having it limited. Uh, certainly there are lots of voices on the Hill that said, no, we think that any FTC Act violation for any, any reason whatsoever uh, should, should justify disgorgement, give the FTC very broad power. So that's how that argument is going to play out. It'll be interesting to see how, uh, how the debate proceeds on Capitol Hill. Can I respond to that, Ashley? I was going to pick up on that note, so yes, go ahead. Um, so I have a brief response. The, the court didn't, didn't respond to, uh, to Alden's argument about just a story and injunction, but, but I did in, in, in the NCLE, NCLA uh, amicus brief, and you can take a look at that. I just, uh, I'll do a shameless plug. It's at nclalegal.org. Um, but, and you can see our brief there, but I did think that that was, uh, that was a good way to go um, when, I, when I first read the argument, but I, I didn't think it should pre prevail. Um, but in any event, um, I, I do, um, I wanna tell your audience, I, I took a look, if you, if you care about the history that Alden and I were just talking about, there is a very nice article in Law 360, High Court Blow to FTC Restitution to be Temporary, by Bruce Hoffman and, and Nico Banks. Um, it goes through all this very nicely. And I usually read news, news uh, pieces and I go, ah, they're full of beans, they've missed something. This is a good piece. Um, I think how bad the behavior has to be, Congress really has to look at that. Because what I was saying about they file a case and they freeze all your assets, the case is over, right? Then they go to you and, and the case is over. You can't fight. You can't dispute anything because you don't have an attorney. Um, there's no private actor who can file a complaint and seize all your assets. Um, if, if you want to do that in almost all litigation, even with the Justice Department, they have to go in and make a, a very specific showing. And one of the things that developed in FTC practice, which I've seen, is they have almost a cookie cutter um, uh, declaration that says these people have overseas property or they are known to flee overseas. And I've had it happen to my clients where they have no overseas property. They've never been out of New York or Florida or wherever, but it's in the cookie cutter declaration. Um, so I, I, have, uh, well, I have some concerns with that type of thing whereby if it works, they keep doing it. And that's true. That's true of almost any agency, but it's true of lawyers too. So, uh, I mean, I think it's just a, a natural occurrence. And I think that is where um, there's gonna be a lot of discussion because uh, there is an accusation made by the government. People shouldn't have everything on the earth taken from them. But as Alden points out in the internet area, there are scammers who do things, take the money and then disappear. Their website just dis disappears and then pops mm -hmm. up as another one. That's a problem. Uh, Congress is gonna have to look at this and that, how do you separate the wheat from the chaff and how do you, you, you strain out the big fish and the, the, the folks who, um, one of the things about deception that really bothers me of the FTC's deception power, which I don't think is gonna change, but it always bothered me. And I'll just mention it here, is that they don't ever have to show a guy who was deceived. 
The FTC never has to go and say, this is John Smith. Look at him. He's woeful. He's been deceived. Never. They just have to say that some guy uh, could objectively be deceived by whatever statements being made somewhere, sometime in, in, in the ether. Uh, I do think that for this sort of thing, they ought to have harmed people who are complaining and saying, you know, I was deceived. Uh, I, I don't like the current test that, uh, that there could be an imaginary deceived person. I'm not, a, I'm not a great fan of that. I like actual, and maybe it's because I was planning for it, but I like actual people who are complaining that they were deceived and injured before you do stuff. Anyway, that's my, my brief response. Should they kind of right, um, I, into my broad question um, I, about, oh, sorry, I think, Auden, I think you're, wait. Okay. Oh, I just want to mention John's brief, okay. it did indeed make that point. I just meant I was surprised the Supreme Court didn't at least address it briefly. But Me too. It's the Supreme Court, they do what they want, so. Uh. Especially Breyer, who seemed to not go too crazy in this case, at least. Um, so, Getting back to kind of the, the theory of harm that you're speaking, I mean, this is a, a bigger issue too, but you see in you know other areas where there's you know antitrust and data privacy issue that come to mind for me, um, you see le you know less and less courts are relying on you know the normal test for harm and are relying on really even that as a factor. And it's not really much of the um, bigger debate right now regarding legislation. If Congress is going to try to legislate by, you know, whether it's amending 13B or um, however they go about doing this, like, how do you see harm actually fitting in, if at all? Well, that's that's a good question, uh, Ashley. I mean, I, th I, I think you're right. There are lots of FTC, certainly in the consumer, actually in both sides of the house, uh, lots of litigation where there's really no, no actual showing of harm. I mean, there are lots of, there are like 40 or 50 or more data uh, protection settlements where the FTC claims that the data protection systems of a firm are inadequate. Uh, a reasonable, reasonably run firm would not have, would have had better uh, protections. And here, here there are all sorts of holes you can show in their uh, security system. So information could be stolen. And it, uh, in some of these, many of these settlements, it hasn't shown that any, any information actually was stolen or that there was actually any harm to consumers. But yet it's created a large, John mentioned the issue of settlements. So it's created a large body that some FTC reps would say, well, there's a common law here, common law developed by settlements. Now, the critics of that, as John would say, would say well, well, no, a settlement is a settlement. It's not binding law. It's a decision by a firm not to litigate because it doesn't want to spend a lot more resources and would be rather prefer to be subject to some sort of Rube Goldberg regulatory contraption going forward to oversee its security systems because it's that, that thing, it'll be less costly than fighting. But but that is a that is a real issue. Uh, I think in um, so what Congress wants to do, I don't know, the FTC on the antitrust side and things like the drug settlements, where in effect, for people, they're, the FTC has brought a number of cases where you have a holder of a patented drug, say the patent's going to uh, expire in five years. Uh, there's a generic firm that's about to enter and there's litigation, generic firm says, your patent doesn't cover my drug, it's, or it's not legitimate. Uh, and uh, the, uh, holder of the brand name drug patent says, no, it is legitimate, but yet it pays off. It gives, say, X millions of dollars to generic firm. They say, tell you what, why don't you enter in three years? That's before the end of the patent period. But, you know, you might have ended in a year, entered a year or two earlier than that. Tell you what, I'll give you some money. Uh, don't uh, delay, uh, enter in three years. The FTC got, in effect, uh, in, in a Supreme Court case called Activist, eight years ago, Supreme Court said the FTC could, if it uh, showed that this was really, just, just really an arrangement to, to split monopoly profits, delay entry, that, that, that it could go after that. 
Uh, and the FTC claims in some cases to be able to measure through statistical econometric measures like uh, the likely cost that would have had of delayed entry and uh, there, there are some problems with measuring that though, frankly, because you don't know if they would have won the, won the patent litigation. Maybe they could have defended the patent and then could have happened for five years. Uh, but the Supreme Court said, no, you have to take that risk. But still, measuring this stuff is very tough. So, and it's subject to a lot of error, as I suggested. What the, what, what the my own sense is, just from having seen a statement by the majority Democratic majorities on the House and Senate Judiciary Committees, they, uh, they seem to assume away the problem of error and of measuring damages. There seems to be a thing, let the FTC get the money, let it get what it wants. And of course, when the bargaining uh, legislative wrangling over language uh, is, in the, is the next stage, but I haven't seen anything, if you're uh, too comforting about that, and, too much of a realization about the real costs of error costs. So what are they going to do? I don't know. I'm not an expert in the legislative process, but uh, it, it, it's something that should be concerning. And there, there's kind of a um, more specific follow-up question we have from audience member here. And it's um, regarding um, how to, with any potential legislation, um, how do you deal with any sort of dichotomy between the FTC's um, views of consumer harms and the consumer's views on whether or not they have been harmed? So in other words, if the consumer is happy with a product, but the FTC says that there has been harm um, or some sort of um, breach of law, how do you, what do you do in that situation? Well, I'll, I'll just say uh, some people like mentholated cigarettes. You may not be able to get those soon. Um, I, 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 think that, uh, I, I think that this is an issue because as I was saying, there's the, this is why I always want there to be a guy who's deceived. I always want there to be an actual person because there's other people on the other side who said, either I wasn't deceived I like the product, I knew all about it, and I want that product, or, you know, lie to me. Uh, they don't care. They, they, so I, but the FTC has to be, uh, does have to be concerned in the broader picture. But this is a big, a big issue. And I think all the people who believe in free markets and, and, you know, the FTC doesn't fully agree with the Latin phrase caveat emptor, right? That, that, that that phrase is not for them. That that sort of gets rid of a lot of the things they do, um, uh, which for, which is buyer beware. I'm sorry, I, I forget sometimes to say what it means in English. But the fact is, um, they do have. I mean, they're they're tasked by Congress to do certain things, and uh, they are allowed to have a view about consumer damage. Um, as I said in my opening remarks, I think it's too wide. I think it's too wide because there may be undamaged consumers and you're going after somebody who's doing something that people out in the market actually want and have never complained about, but the FTC is mad at them. Uh, and they're sitting there going, wait a minute, you didn't, you didn't ever issue a cease and desist order. You never told me a regulation that this is unfair and deceptive. You, you gave me no notice at all. And the FTC's response is, your mother's response, which you do something she doesn't like, you should know, you should know. And then, and then they go and they shut it down. So I don't think though, that that's gonna be addressed in upcoming legislation. I think that issue about the FTC and the consumer harm, uh, we, I just think it's been so long right now that un unless something changes, they're not gonna change that aspect of the FTC being able to decide what's deceptive before they bring a case. Right. I know. Oh, go ahead, Alden. No, I just think I, I, I agree with John. I think the problem is that harm is uh, a big issue for if, if you're trying to get actual money restitution, if you get statutory language. But if, without that, you know, the FTC is just going to say it has a capability, a reasonable person standard, or there's no substantiation of claims. And again, it. it it, it has never really been asked to, to, uh, to prove harm. It, incidentally, I mentioned it was one former head of the policy planning office at the FTC who had assigned, this was in the Democratic administration, 
with a sign on his desk that said caveat venditor, made a seller beware. Seriously. <laughs> Um, so the the um we have a question i think john uh, touched on this a little bit um but more through um analogies of diving into dumpsters i forgot the analogy you made um but what will happen to essentially the current cases um now that 13b does not authorize what they've done to defendants i'll let alden take it first could, could you repeat that somehow i actually somehow i didn't hear it well i think Oh, I'm in sorry. my old age, my bid, my hearing must be failing. It, it's just what will happen with the current cases um, now that it's now that oh, the current really cases. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I think uh, very frankly, um, I, I think there's already some supplemental some supplemental briefs being filed. Look, I mean, the FTC was able to get uh, settlements where parties were willing to fork over. That that is that is. That uh, is done for. Uh, it's not going forward. It's not going to be able to do that. The reality is, though, there in terms of the reverse payment cases, I mentioned that there really are very few right now. But there are other cases. Uh, uh, I mean, there's this issue of, of, of retroactivity, and clearly, I think you're going to get parties. You know, uh, it did. There'll be some interesting legal wrangling as to parties currently in the litigation are going to say, no, you know, we're not going to settle for any money. Uh, but uh, they have to, they're going to be a little bit careful because, as I say, if, 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 if Congress acts and there's some questions about uh, retroactivity, and that that's a messy area of of the law, but but John, being a practitioner, may have a much better sense about how the actual flesh and blood clients are are, are, are reacting to uh, to this dramatic change. So, Ashley, I, I here's what I see and what I think. Uh, I don't know what's going to happen, but I had a I had a case when we were a cause of action of a company and people who had had all their assets frozen, and we. We went to trial. I didn't try it. Uh, some uh, other folks did. They did a great job. And um, the FTC couldn't prove any damages. They had summary judgment on liability, and then they could prove zero damages. So what happens? So the money, all the money that they had seized, well, the receiver had spent it all, but the amount that was left went back to the um, defendants because the FTC proved no damages, right? So I'm going to analogize that. So right now they're not allowed to prove damages. So I've got to assume that the money seized right now is going back. And I've seen some indication of this because the judges, whatever the FTC wants, they're, the judges seem to be, and I, to make this clear, I'll break it up. Alden talked about settlements. There may be better lawyers than me who, who uh, are, are both more adventurous and, and see some angle that I don't see. They've been doing this 40 years. People have settled all over on earth. They've got judgments against folks and taken all these billions I mentioned. I do not see the courts unstringing those. If you've settled or if they have a judgment and they've taken the money and those are done, I don't see how those come unwound. I could be wrong. I don't, anyone listening, I don't want you to say, oh, Vecchioni said that. That's my view. I, I just, I just, I know how courts work. They hate going back that they love settling, they hate going back to the well, and they hate doing extra work. Um, so that's one group of people. I think that's done. Then you've got the people with open cases, cases where they didn't settle, they're still active, the receiver has it. Well, you know, that receiver gets paid out of the, out of the money that the FTC took. The FTC doesn't pay them. They don't go to Congress and say pay them. It's all from that. And in our case, you know, we just said receivers stop spending money immediately. In this case, I'm talking about where they could prove no damages. And we had tried to get the receiver to stop spending money then. I think there's going to be fights with the receiver. And that has a whole bunch of issues because the receiver is, you know, an agent of the court. He says he's got, he's got orders saying this. So what's going to happen there? I think that there's going to be litigation over this. And I also think that um, is the FTC going to pay these receivers out of its pocket? Because... Uh, 
they're going to use Section 19. And for people who sometimes, sometimes the FTC sues people it sued before. And I think it's 15 USC, Alder can help me out here, but I think it's, um, uh, yeah, sec section 15 uh, USC, 57B. They can, yeah. Yeah. they can say that there was, um, that you violated an order that they already had in place. And yes. they're gonna say that, and, and that is contempt of court and that allows them to keep money. I would think they're gonna say that as well. Um, and. It, but that's a narrow group of people, I would think. I can't imagine yeah. tons of orders against people. So these, all of these are going to be fact intensive and they're going to be litigated. I, I really think one of the things that I find interesting is if you haven't settled and you have a live case, are there going to be cases against the FTC and the Court of Claims under the Federal Court Act that they have acted somehow tortiously against you by taking this money unconstitutionally? Um, and illegally in a way that Congress didn't want. Uh, we don't do that kind of law, but as a former plaintiff's attorney, I am very interested in whether that's even possible. And I'd love to hear a federal court yeah. game guy tell me the answer to that question. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's tricky because until a couple of years ago, you had a bunch of, by, of court of appeals precedents binding in a number of circuits that consistently found the FTC had the authority to get this money. So the FTC could, could say, what, what uh, wrongful or unconstitutional uh, taking? This was at the court, that was the, the state of the law was, we had this authority, plain and simple. That was the highest court within these circuits. Said that, the law has changed, but you can, are not gonna retroactively uh, reinterpret the understanding of the law, which, which was one thing until this decision. So that, that won't be the counter argument. Yeah, and, and that is gonna be the counter argument. But to answer the questioner, the FTC is gonna keep going to do exactly what it's been doing as much as it can until the judges or somebody stops it. They're not gonna change their views. They're gonna keep trying to do this under different statutes. Yeah. And their argument's gonna be, these are bad guys. You can't let these bad guys get the money, your honor. And they're going to keep hammering that and they're going to use the various statutes, section 19, uh, 15, whatever they can, whatever they can grasp onto, they're going to use and keep going until stopped. So yeah. I am just, I am just talking about what litigation I see upcoming in fights. And, and I'll, just, I'll just add one final thing. Section 19 is much, is not, is pretty darn now. I know there's some commissioners who wanted to be aggressive and I'm at least in my former role, I think we looked at what you had to prove to show it was a violation of an order and very difficult, pretty darn hard to do. Uh, and, and sometimes it would. So I, I don't think there are really too many great cases. So yeah, and what the, the FTC will do what it can under section 19, but that's a very, very limited option in my view. And how many, Alden, here's a question about that. If you do have to go before the ALJs, you guys got one ALJ, right? I mean, they're, they're there. We only have, there's only one ALJ, that's correct. Right, and so they'd have to go, they'd have to bring all these cases before one guy. Yes. Uh, and, and, and that's a bottleneck. Um, but, yeah. So I, I see that there's, that is an interesting thing that there's one ALJ. Now, the statute lets each commissioner be an ALJ, I'm pretty sure, but I haven't seen it ever done. But, but I do think they're allowed to like sit as the ALJ and maybe that multiply it. All right. But I've never seen that done and I don't expect yeah. Commissioner Rush, Rush, the late Commissioner Rush, who was a litigator, wanted to do that. And I think he, he did that in a very limited, and he prom said, oh, commissioners, you should sit, warm yourselves off, sit as an ALJ. And they didn't want to do that. <laughs> So, uh, but but you're but you're right. There is potentially yes, that commissioners could could play that role, individual commissioners. Yeah. Well, I and mean, you mentioned the FTC, you know, wanting to be aggressive under Section 19B, and you see that under more than just Section 19. Um, you know, more recently, a lot of talk of more aggressive enforcement. Do you think that this decision, plus the fact that Congress is also taking up this debate, will in any way? impact um, what, you know, the FTCs, how they're going to act in terms of, um, you know, how aggressive they're going to be or what types of cases or any other implications? <sighs> uh, 
And, and any, any additional implications? I, let, let me just add one more thing on 19. Again, you can invoke that if the violation of, of an order, but it also has to be basically fraudulent or knowingly deceptive uh, or conduct that a reasonable person would have known. The statute says reasonable man. Well, a reasonable person would have known would, would be clearly deceptive or fraudulent. And that's just a tiny slice of the case that the FTC goes after. And I think the FTC recognized the consumer protection side that, that uh, and, and the true hardcore of scam fraudsters are not the ones you're gonna really be able to go after because if you say, oh, well, they violated an order, now we're gonna find a violated order. By the time you do that, whatever additional assets hadn't had been frozen, and they will have flooded the jurisdiction. So it's not really a very, it's not really a practical solution, I think, uh, for, for most situations. And I'm sure the FTC is going to argue that to Congress. And I, th I think they already are saying, look, this is just not you know, section 19. Maybe you can revamp section 19 too, but you really need to, to revamp and rewrite section 13B. Is there your statute of limitations for section 19? Like three years? Okay. Yes, three years. Uh, so, Ashley, I, I see another consequence of this decision, though. Uh, mm -hmm. Brian's analysis and the way this, this, and it's not just FTC, all the agencies have been given very broad powers over various judicial interpret, interpretive canons and ideas that came um, really the high crest after World War II between the 40s and I'd say the 80s and 90s, the way the courts would say, um, I'm, I'm boiling it down and I'm being a little flippant, but they're doing good. Why stop them? Right. I mean, that wasn't really what they said, but that was kind of the, the thrust of where the courts are. I think that that this was a nine zero decision when they know full well what the FTC is arguing. The FTC did not hide its light under a bushel on this. They said, here's what we're doing with it. Here's why it needs to be done. And they didn't get one vote because the court has changed. The interpretive analysis has really changed so that all nine of them want words from Congress. They want language. They can, they can say, this does that. And I'm not embarrassed in front of my colleagues to say that this is allowable because I have this hook. Now, some will use legislative history. We know some will not, but even, even some legislative history. I, I think that the folks who are for more activist government and view the Constitution as allowing a lot more administrative power and a lot more um, government power, they want something. They, they're no longer willing to just go, eh, it looks good to me. And I think that that is a, that is a salutary development, but I think that all the agencies have to assume that people like me are gonna be looking at this decision and saying, well, what other power is not clear in the statute? And pulling and pulling them back. I mean, I know that's something that I've been thinking since I read this, and I bet you there's thousands of other lawyers in the country thinking that right now. Just one additional thought: a number of the commissioners now want to do rulemaking, both competition rulemaking, which is the APA Administrative Procedure Act rulemaking, and potentially, I guess, some more consumer protection. But they're really talking about administrative rulemaking in the antitrust area. And that, that and I think particularly uh, you have violations of rules, you can, uh, you, you can then get, uh, th that's a way of getting uh, restitution potentially. But that, that opens up a number of questions. There are questions about the, if the FTC has specific authority to do consumer protection rules, did rules on passed in 1974, special statutory language. There is this thing, Section 60 of the FTC Act that has really only been invoked once in a, in a rule regarding posting of octane ratings way back in the 70s. And, and there, so there's a real question about whether the FTC can enact substantive antitrust related rules or as opposed to just procedural rules. So that is a big thing going forward. And there would be challenges to FTC's rulemaking authority to the so-called deference, Chevron deference they might get. Uh, and there's also, so I think there'll also be legislative efforts to give the FTC maybe enhanced or more specific rulemaking authority. 
Oh. And I will say this, and there's a fight, since this is congressional, there is a fight, Ashley, because I have always been a proponent of rules by the FTC to tell people what they're doing wrong before they do it wrong so they can guide their activities. I, but I have met and heard many people in industry don't want rulemaking. They prefer uh, rulemaking by legislation to the sue and settle this, the sue and decide what's wrong. That I can't imagine that, but I have heard it from industry and I'm sure Congress will be hearing it. I think that'll continue to be the case though. I mean, as the FTC was, you know, let's take the antitrust debate, for example, um, they're calling on the FTC to be a lot more aggressive than they were. It doesn't seem like they would, you know, prefer that framework as opposed to something a lot more narrow and certain. Well, the FTC, the FTC doesn't want it more narrow, but now that they have to go to Congress, what I'm saying is they may get more narrow. I meant the litigants, but yeah, oh. that, that makes sense. Um, so we have, I'm gonna try to get the one or two questions um, that we have here. Sorry, we have quite a few here. Um, so there, there's one that's, this is in the kind of in the context of private right, rights of action um, and whether or not the FTC, uh, whether there, is an argument against finding actual duties in the FTC Act. It says, what impact will this ruling likely have on the question of whether private litigants can rely upon the FTC Act as creating actual duties under state common law, where the private litigants are seeking monetary damage akin to restitution and the agency now cannot. Can we address a little bit of that? And that's an interesting question. There is no federal private right of action under the FTC Act, however, Almost all the states have little FTC acts, most of which do have, almost all have private rights of action. And there is a lot of precedent in state courts that says that, that precedents or, or things that are viewed as unfair or deceptive under the FTC Act will be under, are incorporated by reference under our statute. And so in effect, if certain practice that the FTC was going after, but now it can't get, get monetary relief under 13B, if you can, under the little FTC Act, uh, based on that, there it's a possibility you'll be get no new new creative efforts by uh, by plaintiffs' attorneys and, and under state law. We'll see. Yeah, and I and I want to the little FTC Acts. I didn't mention them, but usually, certainly on the deception claims, certainly when the FTC has decided it really doesn't like something, it doesn't just sue one person. It has a policy to go to the various states and start saying, we're gonna sue on this because, you know, and they call it Operation Whatever, okay? And so Operation Whatever, uh, Operation Stop the Scammers, right? And so they go into the various states and they sue along with the uh, state authorities under the Little FTC Act. I think what you will see, usually in my experience, I don't have Alden's uh, view of all this, uh, but in my experience, that when the FTC sues, the state sort of rides along. They don't do most of the work. The FTC does most of the work. I think you may see that change because in the states, they may be able to say under their FTC acts, there are these powers. There are, you can do it under our act. Yes. You're gonna see, you're gonna see them, the FTC moving with the states that will say, we're allowed to seize the money. We're allowed to do this. We're allowed to do that because we're not the FTC act. now. Unfortunately, for, for that theory, there's a lot of cases that say that the uh, little FTC acts are, um, uh, are uh, interpreted the same way as the federal ones. I mean, there are, are state courts that have said that, but I, not all of them, not all of them say that. So I think that you're going to see a wide difference in the states and what the FTC can get various actors they've always worked with to do. And, they, and you may see a step up of the state little FTC acts being used. Yeah, I, I think that the, the, the key thing to remember is that lot, lots of these uh, precedents say that the state, that the, uh, under state law, the FTC's interpretation of what's unfair or deceptive is good under state law, but the state law for substantive provisions, you know, procedural substantive provisions often are different. And uh, the AL, as I say, do allow for private rights of action. Also state antitrust law, for example, under federal antitrust law, resale price maintenance is rule of reason. Under in California, New York, as a matter of state law, it's per se illegal. And you can recover damages in private actions under, under California, New York law. So anyway, it, it, it's, it, 
it, there, there is an opportunity, I think, for plaintiffs lawyers to, to be more creative at the state level. So operations stop the scammers. Doesn't the Supreme Court rule in favor of scam artists? Um, I, I thought that was said sometime recently. Any quick comments on that? I I will just say that as I as you probably I probably alluded to it, and that was this: um, the Supreme Court is not supposed to be for or against either side. So I thought that that was an intemperate remark uh, on, on the. On, by the acting chairman, but uh, they put a lot of they put a lot of uh, uh, money on this wheel coming up pro 13b. So as long as it's not as they as long as they don't uh, repeat that a lot, I think I'll let her go this time because it must have been a disappointment. Um, they ruled for Congress getting involved. They ruled for the law and the text. Uh, I think that's all they ruled for. I don't think they really like the scammers, um, but nonetheless. I think that was a sign of the disappointment here and how important this uh, invented power has become. And it wasn't in the statute and it wasn't in the history and yet it became a major um, enforcement tool. It's a very interesting story, I think. Yeah, notably the statement did not include the statutory text. Um, any quick thoughts to wrap things up for my view? I'll go, I'll go. I'll, I'll go first and I'll let Alden finish since he let me start. Um, I'm very heartened by this decision. I, I was a little bit disappointed in the Lou decision, uh, although it was better than the previous uh, uh, state of affairs. I think that uh, the FTC is gonna get more powers. I don't know what they're gonna be. I'm not a congressional expert, just like Alden isn't. I have no idea. I assume that Congress is gonna take some action because I do think the the problems of the internet guys who pop up and disappear is going to be something that Congress is going to want to know because those folks are going around doing things to old people. Old people call their congressmen. So I have a feeling something will be done. Um, but, uh, but I was very heartened by this. This is a good development in the law. And the FTC took, took it on the chin this time. But I think for the rule of law, overall, this is a good decision because Congress has been told it's got to be clear what remedies it's giving. The Supreme Court uh, has said that the administrative agencies can't just make stuff up. I think that's good for everybody. Speaking for myself, I, I, I tend to agree. I mean, I think I'm not surprised by the decision. I'm a little surprised. I thought that, for instance, Justice Sotomayor or one or two justices might dissent. I was surprised and unanimous, I'll admit. But uh, I, I do think that there is the FTC is going to argue very hard and certainly uh, very successfully that there is a big internet fraud uh, issue and that there's a lot of harm that will explode and that will grow. And yes, there's state authorities and other authorities, but it needs that, uh, that, uh, that ability. Uh, to me, a real, the really tough, important question is, okay, we'll give you authority to get, um, you know, seize assets and, and get recoveries, but is it going to be limited to hardcore fraud or is it going to be broader than that? And again, I don't, I don't know how that argument is going to turn out. I, I hope that it's uh, really narrowed into, so you're really dealing with actual consumer injury, but remains to be seen. I think that's a, a great note, to, a great question to end on. Um, so thank you all for coming out today um, and spending part of your Friday afternoon here. Um, thank you to both of our panelists. So that was a really great discussion. We all have learned a lot, I think. Um, and have a great Friday. Thank you, Ashley, for, for hosting it. Thanks, hey. for thanks John. <laughs>